Perfect. So this is really, really special to me. Um, it's special because we thought we're organizing a meeting for, you know, 3, 30, 40 guys who are interested. And now we have over 200 people which is amazing because this is a very, very deep tech summit. It's not something that is, you know, for business development or anything like that, which will still happen. But we have the best brains in the world today here on this. And that is indeed super exciting. watch our so yeah usually this is without audio but thanks to HDMI we have this all on perfect um, so what you need to watch is like the interest that these animals have in drones and uh, just, just just watch their games Good. And yeah, we're a lot of people here. So I hope you use the opportunity to mingle. I hope you use the opportunity to speak to other developers. Ramon has also already introduced myself. I think I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But for me, it's really special that over 10 years after creating a number of open source projects that together form a software stack for a drone, we're back here with a large international development community. Back at ETH, where this all started, and given that ETH is hosting us, I also wanted to do a bit of introduction, like one slide. There's one very famous student of ETH Zurich, in case you didn't know. Uh, along with more than 20 uh, Nobel, other Nobel laureates. So, it has a long history, and it has a lot of drone projects and drone research going on. Now, if you haven't done that yet, feel free to take a picture. Like, this is the perfect title slide for your social media. <laughs> and, and share it, because I think we're doing a lot of great work, but we're not talking enough about it. And I believe that this is beneficial to everybody in this room to make sure there's a bit more awareness, in particular with adopters, in particular with your manager or your customers. It's a thing. And then, of course, I'm going to do the same thing. And this slide is just to illuminate the room a little more. So... Perfect. And since it's 2019 and it's the age of the influencer. <laughs> Wonderful. And, and in terms of influencer, I think that is also like I was struggling for a decade how to explain what you are, right? Sometimes corporate folks think like, yeah, you know, the, these are the geniuses and they deserve respect and all of that. That's true, but that's not enough. The people in the development community are technical geniuses, but they are on top of that influencers. Because what happens is that your work ends up in many different places and because it's so good content, it actually influences whole organizations and industries. And I think that's the best way to think about open source. It's grassroots, it's democratized engineering the same way as social media influencers have to some degree, for better or worse, democratized social media and, and the media in general. And so I think that's really powerful. So let's use that. 
I w also want to show a little bit of history because we have awesome content through the next two days and I don't want to sort of take that content away from people as they're introducing it, so I'm not going to go very deep. But I just wanted to show it's a long journey. It's a journey that started 2008 here and that went through many different stages of a whole technology stack. So nine years ago, we did this. You can see ETH logo, the old Pixar logo. That's when you start to see that stuff is really old. And who recognizes this application? Yeah, you see, that's Q Ground Control nine years ago. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And it's still here. So this is... Uh, the simulation log replay, here you have this weird thing where you can control multiple drones. Amazing, complete the usability from hell. But that's what the start was 10 years ago. You already could take off a vehicle. Um, yeah, it's, it's, quite, it's quite gross. But it's actually interesting to see. So, I think the evolution over nine years is actually a long way. At the same time, when I look back, it's not so fundamentally different that nine years ago, I would have expected that we actually get a little further in this whole industry. It seems such a long time. Now, eight years ago, what did we get? Well, another ETH video. Same old logo. And... That is indoor GPS denied navigation solved in hardware. I mean, you can clearly see it. But it's actually pretty cool because eight years ago, we were already able to fly completely autonomously a mission indoors. And yes, indoor navigation as a sensory system hasn't been solved. But it clearly did work by throwing a lot of logistics at the problem. So again, to me, in a way, hilarious. In another way, well, that was almost a decade ago. And we're still not doing this like all the time, everywhere. There's not an indoor localization system that's in every building. You still needed to find your way into this lecture room without navigation assistance. So, if you came of age at the same time as me and studied around the same time, it's like actually a bit frustrating because a decade seems like a long time. Now, seven years ago, what do we do there? A little more, a little more outside, and it's actually getting closer to what we're doing. So GPS denied navigation now with optical flow. Now, of course, others did as well. Um, while following, you will see that people will talk about structure following in inspection in the next 18 months a lot. That's a thing now. So they're doing wall following. And it's about right because you say on average it takes about a decade to go from research to industry. So here we are. And interestingly enough, the software architecture of that thing is the same thing as today. Like no changes. Just better software. What we also, well, yeah, a little more visualization. What we also did is autonomous exploration. Now, we're not there yet, so we still have to catch up with it. So what this drone is, and it's not on a tether, it, that's just sort of the safety mitigation with early technology. What it's doing, it's finding out which areas it doesn't know yet. That's the green and the blue line. And then it's exploring these frontiers. And I think it's going to make my PhD colleague, Dominic, really famous. I'm sure he loves it. And so it, it finds its own way and navigates with optical flow and integration. So autonomy to the last level, like high level goal is see the world, go. Nothing else, no mission, no planning, it just goes. 
There is no such product today, but they will. And based on my estimate, in around three years. So we've come a long way from research software that wasn't productized, worked once or twice or five times, to something that's deployed now in hundreds of thousands, if not millions of vehicles. And that's hard. That's incre incredibly hard. What I want to show, and this is a w great way to show it, is how this is accelerating exponentially. So we're having more and more contributors, which is important. It's actually incredible, like we have 200 people here, which means there are a lot more hundreds out there who are not here today. And as you can also see, it largely has been a firmware development. But when you leave the summit, don't talk about PX4 as firmware. It's a stack. It's a collection of software that enables autonomy. And we're starting to see that more and more because we had mostly firmware development, but if you actually account for all the things that we're developing, and some of them have been around longer, but we, we're picking up contributors now, it's a whole thing where we're getting heavier and heavier on computer vision, on interfacing with the world through the SDK. And so it's getting more complex, which drives this exponential growth. Also drives exponential cost, which means as a company, you need to share the workload. You can't do it yourself anymore. You can see also that we have a majority of independent contributors or from, from smaller companies that are not members. And then you see some heavy hitters. That was 2000. 18, 2019 for sure will look a bit different. And that's good. So we have companies that have huge contributions, significant buy-in, but we also have a very healthy long tail of contributors. That's what you want. You want breath, but then people who actually put effort into it, stand behind it and push it. And those are all the contributors in the core projects. Now, you know, we've generated this like a couple weeks ago, so don't be offended if you're not on there. But we get pretty good coverage with this picture. And that's awesome. That's a lot of people. And it's growing. It, con it continues to grow very fast. So in talking about PX4, in talking about the stack, I think it's most useful to think as sort of what we used to refer to as firmware is kind of the kernel. But then we have a lot of things around it. We have the hardware standards on Pixoc. We have the communication protocol on Mavlink. We have the SDK, which has the old logo here. We'll, we'll have a new one. Um, and of course, we have the industry association drone code. We have we have also third-party projects that are really important, really close. Roz, Tully is here, which is awesome. So that's all part of it. The same way as if you talk about Linux, yes, you're talking about a kernel, but actually what you kind of mean is this whole big thing that's installed on your computer, which is thousands of software packets outside of just a computer. So... This is sort of the core stack, and then a couple of hardware targets that we run on. I think this will look very different by the end of this year. And it's great when technology works and loses connection, so. These are the products, and I'm sure I, I didn't get full coverage here, that are using our technology. So it's a lot. It's a lot of different things. It's cargo drones, it's small drones, large drones. It's, it's crazy. It's everything. And it's in different verticals. So I think what we're seeing is consumer drones from Unique, from Teal, from other companies, uh, from 
yeah, like quite a number. Then commercial, I think this is actually where the bulk of adoption right now is. This is where we have unique, but then also a lot of other drones like the IF750A, which is a reference design for a high-end commercial drone. So I think a lot of you will be interested in that domain. But then we have more and more industrial. And I just want to introduce these categories because I think they will help us as a community to organize. And showing what I just showed in a number of contributors, you also can show that in how the software is developing. So we have this accelerating exponential growth where you have a number of software packets that each start humble, you know, small, thin, and then as you grow them, they are still manageable individually. But we tend to add one per month already, almost. And so as you stack slices, you end up with an exponential curve. That is a good thing because we have a lot more functionality. It's a bad thing for anybody trying to do that themselves because it's the same thing as cost. And I also want to just, you know, you all know this, but it's more getting to a point to, to articulate it simply. Like, now we all here in this room want to make that better, right? But pretty much all of the developers here are professional, right? They're paid by a company. So how do you, how do you explain what you're doing, how you leverage that? Do you, like, start with it, copy it, and then make it better and have your own? No, that, that's not how it, how it works. The way it works is you have your product, and then you can have your differentiation on top of it. The trick is to know what your differentiation is. Like, what is it, what you're doing different, better? And usually you win as a company if you're focused on the customer. And so it's important that as you go back and develop your business, in particular if you're a startup, you're kind of usually not looking so, so much into it. You just need something. Like, think about what your differentiation is. And think about, from a software architecture perspective, how can you make sure you can develop your differentiation and stay involved, contribute to upstream? What kind of interfaces do you need? What kind of layers? What APIs? What abstractions? It's really important that you're clear about it and that you're coming back and articulating this to other developers because that is the grease that allows collaboration to happen, to be very clear about it. And then now the question is, okay, why do you care? You care because if you do this right, then you're going to be able to upgrade this on the next level. And when I'm talking about upgrading, I'm not talking about, you know, a new PX4 firmware version. That's old news. Flight control is not a way to differentiate. That's over. That's like building your own operating system. That was over in the IT industry a very long time ago. No, what you differentiate on is user-facing features, like how do you exactly capture data? How do you transmit data? How deep do you integrate different sensors to achieve a consistent capture result? And then what you need to be adding is things like obstacle avoidance, computer vision, the SDK, and when you do it right, you just move in time up here, and you're not updating PX4. No, you're adding more of the stack. And a lot of it will run on the computer next to the core flight controller. And that computer, which usually handles the mission, so I call it the mission computer, that is going to be more and more important, and we've already built out the infrastructure to handle that. What I also want to make very clear is we're at an inflection point. The drone industry has been growing, and all of you come into this and think like, oh, there are a lot of companies, and, you know, it's sprawling. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ramon, water will be awesome. Um, 
it's really sprawling and it's it's great and you know all these different things and people try different things yes that's true but i won't surprise you when i tell you it's not going to stay that way because there has been an industry that has been in the same shape and that's cars so what we see here is a ford model t and that has a number of important connotations and I'm, I'm trying to train your pattern matching a bit on drones. You know, create a bit of distance from yourself from this industry and look at the patterns. And so what you see is it kind of, it has product market fit. So it has wheels, it has a suspension, it has a fuel engine. Well, that, that's kind of going away, but still. It has a steering wheel. It has four seats, not two. And so you can call this the first product market fit of a car. And we've actually not changed that much about it in the last hundred years. All the details got better. And then it has something else that is not visible. It's manufactured on a production line. Now, if you know drone companies, if you're part of one, do you have a production line? Or do you have a table and then one person working on a drone finishing there and there is another table with another drone? We're kind of in between. Not a lot of people have a production line yet, but Ford had, and it drove prices down to a point where it was actually affordable enough to be relevant as an industry. We're right at that point. Now, let me show you something else. The number of car manufacturers actually was around 5,000 in the 1900s, right? Pretty much like... One or two people working on a car in a barn, manufacturing five cars a year. Does that sound familiar? Maybe manufacturing 200 cars, that's still nothing. And so there was this growth because people actually thought like, oh, it's actually working, like people want it. And then there was this steep decline because as you go from this, which is, I don't know if you call this a two-seater or one-seater, it's actually an Opel, like if you're familiar with European car brands, you're not associating that with the first car and innovation. Um, Ford Model T, then we have this, and, you know, those are, you know, one has a roof, but other than that, it's not any more fundamentally different. But there's a steep drop-off, and that's really important to embrace because what happened? Well, it, the complexity reached a level where you can't just build everything yourself. And you had even things like bolts and nuts and screws who were bespoke. It's incredible. But standardization in the mechanical industry didn't happen before 19, 1917 in Germany and 1918 in the US. That's incredible. So all the steam engines were manufactured with, you know, okay, I need this screw, so I'm going to make it one inch, two-thirds, or whatever. Nothing, nothing standardized, nothing off the shelf. That's, of course, not sustainable. And so that standardization is what allowed companies to continue to innovate. Now the question is, what is the equivalent of that today? It's open source. It's open source because writing standards is taking forever. So it's really hard to actually standardize, you know, something that you don't quite know how it should look like. Like, when we standardize obstacle avoidance today, like, what should we standardize? Do you know? I, I at least know I don't know. But there is a way to drive that in parallel by essentially developing a reference implementation as open source while you drive this. And so you end up with something that's shared, that's common, that's a known quantity, without the full overhead of your standardization process. And once you're done and you've proven that it works, you can actually go ahead and say, like, actually, that's now the standard API and it's stable. So I also wanted to quickly go through the roadmap because we've actually achieved a few things. We're lagging on others. 
Um, and I want to also hold ourselves a bit accountable to that. So the longer we have these discussions on the next Dev Summits, I want to make sure that we're tracking this, that we're successful in execution. So, for example, Daniel has put a lot of work into the driver's overhaul, so I think we're making good progress. On hardware testing, we're making good progress. That's awesome. Um, there are other things where we're lagging. Like, for example, there will be a big push for a secure bootloader this year because a lot of our adopters require it. DMA, we've made some progress. It's not there yet. So, overall, I would say we're, we're doing quite okay. The 1.9 release was delayed compared to what we wanted to achieve, but that's okay. We have really high quality release. We will have something that's more on time next time. And now we can also look at, well, what's going to happen next. 1.10. Just to recap, September. And so that is what we wanted to focus on based on the last roadmap. Now, I'm pretty sure that by Friday evening, this whole thing is completely obsolete. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing because in the discussions over the next two days, we will learn what is relevant and what is not, what needs to be added. I also want to show a few highlights that we achieved. Well, quality assurance as a process, and I'm, the more I show this, the more I realize people actually don't know. So the weird thing that happens that's re rejecting your pull request, right? This, this weird thing where you have this one red X, that's actually a fairly sophisticated process. So let me quickly walk you through it. So this is all standard, right? We all hopefully know how to contribute upstream. But then what we have, code review, clear, that's normal. We have automated module tests that run unit testing. We have automated flight simulation that go through manual control, emission, on VTOL, on multi-copter, different things. It all needs to pass that. And we have a physical flight test by our team in Mexico who go out and fly every day, unless they're at the developer summit, which is also good. And so that's actually a fairly complete process already for an open source project. Now, we want to double down on every of these aspects. We want to have more on hardware testing. We want to have more simulation testing. We we're, going to we're going to leverage MAV SDK heavily. And we're going to synchronize the tests that we are doing in simulation with the tests that are being done outdoors. So we get to really high coverage numbers and a really high test traceability. So I would love to invite you all to contribute to that and also expect that having a unit test and having a simulation test as part of the pull request is going to be a requirement going forward. Because we're putting drones above people's heads and we have a responsibility to go to the highest levels of quality assurance. Then what we're also doing on the drone code level is type certification. Type certification, that's, that sounds pretty crazy. But we're certifying, it's always specific to an aircraft. We're certifying an aircraft, so they are essentially saying, well, we trust your fail-safe modes, we trust your operation, we trust your engineering. And anybody using PX4 on this particular airframe, but then also on others, as you run through the certification process, are allowed to do things that you're usually not allowed to do. For example, you're allowed to fly at night, which is not allowed by default by FAA. You're allowed to fly over people. And you don't need to get a special waiver, you just can because this particular aircraft is fulfilling the requirements. So that's ongoing. Going to keep you updated on it. But that's an important milestone for the industry. What we're also doing, and this is something that is driven by Daniel and David, 
is on hardware testing. So running all the boards, running unit tests on boards, making sure CPU load and everything is okay. And we're also going now towards hardware in the loop testing, so these boards go out and fly without leaving their rack. And that helps us ensuring quality across all these different configurations. Now, this is maybe the most important slide because it's a big change. It's a big change because we're, as a software team, not going to stay on a microcontroller. PX4 is moving very quickly to be not a middleware per se, but a distributed stack that's running on the flight control side using a publish subscribe system called UORP that you've all used to also interface directly with ROS2 and to add things like vision-based navigation and obstacle avoidance. I mean, there's now a PX4 slash avoidance repository that says a lot and also connecting with the SDK. And that's going to run on the wide variety of onboard computers from very small ARM boards to very high Intel solutions. And I know that a lot of you have worked on that as part of academic research or as part of a prototype, but we're completely standardizing this. There's going to be one way to do it, and it's going to be simple, and it's going to be something that everybody does because we cannot get to the next level of autonomy without providing the infrastructure across this hybrid system. And what will remain here will be the safety critical parts because the regulators want us to have something that's boxed up, controlled, authenticated, and what they can essentially say, well, okay, we trust this particular component, which leaves us the freedom to go bananas on the mission computer and build great autonomous software. And what you can do with this is then really avoid obstacles. Yeah. And this is a pretty basic demo, but something that's going to be really required as a default, avoiding things like poles and inspections. And I want to bring this to pretty much every PX4 enabled drone by default. It's also something that's highly relevant if you're doing things like a survey. Because you might forget about that elevation, that bush, tree, pole that's in there. And this is something that's working today. We're working on getting this in ready to fly platforms like the IF 750, like a smaller developer quad. But that's something you can use today. And that's where Alteran is investing heavily and really building software from the ground up to enable this community, not just fiddling a bit with it or polishing it slightly. Good. Now, the next step that's going to unlock a lot of integrations is the SDK. And we have a dedicated session from Jonas and Julian about it. So I'm just introducing the high level concept. Look at the schedule, attend the session. But it's a really rich environment that has language bindings for all the major languages you care about, a really high-performance C++ core, so you can deal with lots of connections, lots of drones if you need to. And that sits on top of Mavlink, that's why it's called Mav SDK, and makes it easy to interface PX4-powered drones. And of course, we're striving towards standards, so we're really just targeting Mavlink, but at the same time, given the context here, we're making sure that PX4 is sticking to the Mavlink standard. And the other thing is airspace integration. So 
We've talked about this a lot of times. This is just a reminder. Um, there is already an integration of the AirMap service. I hope we will have more integrations. Just remember that that's around and can be leveraged. And then we're pushing towards safety and certification on a number of fronts. And it's kind of a bit diverse right now because regulators don't know what they want to actually require. So what we're doing is we're laying the foundations towards functional safety. We're looking at automotive standards because those are more balanced in terms of complexity and safety than the very high-end manned aviation standards. And we're doing our homework right now on many different fronts. I think that's also really important for this community and this is something that Altarian and others are very interested in. Now, we've already seen that. And then there is a new aspect to it. That's hardware. Now, if you're in software, you kind of think like hardware, what's the thing, do I care? It's actually really important. And I created the Pixhawk Autopilot with a small team in 2013 at the same time as creating PX4. So we had this great consistency and we had very little hardware problems other than our lack of experience at the time. But now what's happening more and more is that we have this sprawling hardware ecosystem where you have safety problems because the power supply works differently, because the sensor is interfaced differently because one board is temperature calibrated, another is not. That's not how we're going to get to a enterprise-grade software platform. And that's why we've decided it's time again for full reference designs, for an actual autopilot module that can be manufactured consistently by partners. And so there's a Pixhawk developer call uh, on Tuesdays, but we're also driving towards having hardware that is more consistent, helping manufacturers get the core right, and then enable them to differentiate on whatever additional functionality wa they want to build on, what additional services, baseboards. So we're not going to, to build one version of this, but we're going to give them a design that has been completely vetted from the start, which is pretty much what Pixhawk was, right? The same thing, design that works, now go out and build your own, change the form factor, innovate on top, but keep a consistent system. So this is sort of... The early prototype, this doesn't exist yet. This is in discussion with the hardware development community, but it will have a 100-pin expansion connector. It will have Ethernet as a new interface for 2019 companion computers, mission computers, really relevant. And we're going to help the whole industry by providing a reference design on that. Good. With that... And just in time, thank you all for coming. And I'm really looking forward to really in-depth discussions over the course of the next two days. Right, before we end, uh, is there any questions from the audience? Yes, let me repeat the question first. What is the status of the FAA work? And maybe you can give a little bit more overview about it. So working with regulators means that things, of course, take a long time to develop. And uh, that's something that has been done by drone code over the past two years. And the current indication is that we should be through the process in the next three months. That is the indication by FAA. Now, they're doing this for the first time. So just let me repeat that they're doing it for the first time. But we will see. But we have indications that it should be around the corner. Any other question? All right. Thank you, Lorenz.
Mm-hmm.